On numerous occasions, I have mentioned how I enjoy the Wednesday night speakers. I listen, number one, for my own benefit, as all of us should. But number two, I'm always having things come to mind that encourage me from the standpoint of being a preacher of the gospel and what all you can think of and to teach people on. And I think uh, this past Wednesday night, Brother Charlie's lesson caused me to think about some things, and I was looking through then later on in the week and came to some of these thoughts that I would like to present to you this morning. I hope will be helpful to you as you strive to overcome sin, to be faithful, to serve God. At the same time, to those who are not Christians, who are outside of Christ and never known salvation, to cause you to think about your own life as you ought to and consider what it is to gain the remission of sins through belief and obedience to our Lord's gospel. And I hope this will be helpful. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. And let us see that there's some things there that may cause us to conclude what the greatest sin was there in Eden. Now let me give you this material in way of, by way of introduction. You'll remember in our Lord's earthly ministry that Jesus declared that Satan had asked to have Simon Peter. Remember the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired, in the American Standard Version 1901 says, ask to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Luke 22 and verse 31. That word sift, S-I-F-T, is the translation of the Greek word siniazo, which means to shake in a sieve, a sift by trial and temptation. Now with regard to Job of the Old Testament, God said to Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand but save his life, Job 2 and 6. And Peter says this to all of us in 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be sober, be watchful, for your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Then he says to us, whom withstand steadfast in your faith, knowing that the same sufferings are accomplished in your brethren who are in the world. Again, 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9. The Lord said to certain Jews, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father it is your will to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and standeth not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father thereof. John 8 and verse 44. With those thoughts in mind, turn back with me then to the third chapter of the book of Genesis, and we'll read verses uh, 1 through 8. Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 8. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it. Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, 
and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. With those thoughts in mind, let's look a little bit at the situation we find in the beginning of things, reminding ourselves what I'm sure to most of us are, are quite familiar. God had placed Adam and Eve in the paradise of Eden. He had given them marvelous privileges and blessings. God had also placed upon them certain restrictions. Now with regard to the tree in the midst of the garden, God had said, Thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Verse 17. The devil, by the agency or by means of the serpent, came into the garden. And in all of his characteristic subtlety, he approached the woman. And it almost seems, though I would not be dogmatic on this, that she's alone at the time that he comes to her. He began with really what we would call an insinuating question. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Well, the woman responded, God has said no such thing. She then explained what God had said. Now, the serpent said, ye shall not surely die. Thus he sought to, watch it, remove the fear of punishment from her. You put that in your mind, and you'll see it works that way every time. If God has said you do this or you don't do this, and you will suffer punishment because of your rebellion and disobedience, some way or the other, to some extent or the other, Satan is going to try to get you to realize he's not going to get on to you because of this. He's not going to punish you. So there's a move right there that we ought to get in our own minds to realize that when we know this says we do this, or we do this in this way, or at a certain time, or it's a sin, or rather it's, a, it's something we ought to omit, then just put it down when our thoughts start trying to say, well, really, it's not going to be that bad. Do you hear the hiss of the serpent? The serpent continued, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes will be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Did you notice that he promised some wonderful rewards? Well, even Moses said, or the Bible says about Moses, that he did not choose to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Satan can reward you. Do you remember in Matthew 4, the temptation of the Christ, that he said, fall down and worship me, and I will give you all these things. So remove fear, and then say there's great rewards. Two of the devices of Satan to get you to do what you know you shouldn't, or leave undone what God says, that you should do. So the devil, notice, questioned the goodness of God. He questioned the goodness of God. That is, in God's restricting the, the man and the woman, and it would be on anything wherein he has given us prohibitions. He's actually saying God's not really showing proper concern for you. He questioned also the severity of God. God's not really going to punish you. And he questioned the actual motive of God. And it sort of sounds like children at times. God just doesn't want you to have what you really should have. And by the way, that's the way a lot of children approach their parents to get them to see whether you really mean the restrictions you placed on me. So it may be that your children can be the 
voice through which Satan can speak sometimes. And I suggest that through our dear loved ones and best friends and our good church members, that sometimes they are the serpent in the garden. Now note this. What is the devil doing when he does these things? He's slandering God to man. He's slandering God to man. In dealing with Job, it's the other way around. The devil slandered man to God. Remember, the only reason he serves you is because of the blessings. In other words, you pay him to take those away and he won't serve you. So you see why the Lord said he was a liar from the beginning. That's all he can tell is a lie because he's the father of lies. So when you know the static standard of truth made plain in God's word as to our conduct, whether it's forbidding us or whether it's authorizing us, then when we begin to say, well, does he really mean it? Or really, is it that bad if I do it? Or whatever. Then there's the hiss of old Satan still with us today that he heard long years ago in the garden. Now, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took the fruit thereof and did eat. Then notice, then the woman gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, the Bible teaches that by this transgression of God's law, back there in that wonderful, marvelous paradise of Eden that none of us can really grasp in our minds today, the devil was successful in injecting sin and death into the world. And that's both physical death and spiritual death. Physically, they begin to die from that point forward. Spiritually, they died immediately. Death meaning separation from God. So that's how sin and death got into the world. Now, Paul will say something about that very thing. In uh, the book of Romans, chapter 5 and verse number 12. Now watch it. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. When you study then about Eve and Adam in particular sinning, then you're studying about how it all got here. The doorway through which Satan injected sin and the death that comes to those who commit those sins into the world. Now when Adam and Eve partook of that fruit that God had forbidden them to eat, we recognize, as I've just noticed, that a great and terrible sin has been committed. No one would deny that that knows the Bible is the good word of God. But I wonder if the following is, is not the greatest sin that's committed in Eden. And what would it be? She listened. It would never happen if she hadn't listened. It never would have happened if she hadn't given attention to what was being said. You know, sometimes it's not good to listen. If Satan were actually going to stand here as he did in the form of the serpent and deal with Eve, and you knew it was Satan... And you knew his whole reason for existing is to destroy you. Would you really listen to him? Would you want to give him any time at all? Would you want to let him have equal time to, say, the Apostle Paul, if he were here and preaching the truth, or to Jesus himself? Well, we've heard the Lord. Let's hear from Satan now. I don't think we would want to listen to him at all. If she had just stopped there, I need to listen only to what God said. I need to be reminded of what he said. I need to live according to what he said because he loves me. And these commandments are for my good. And, and as I keep this commandment, or we are today, any of God's commandments, then I show him my love for him and my faith in him. And after all, look what he's done for me. I don't have time for you, Satan. I'm not going to listen to anything you're saying. Now why? What did Satan do? He sought to slander God. He sought, as the father of lies, to challenge anything God had said. Now, 
when you know your Bible, when you understand the Word of God, when you know this applies to your thinking and your words and your conduct as the way you're to live, and you hear somebody else saying something else, let me ask you, who is that really saying that? You know, the truth travels through men preaching it. How does error travel? You just, you know, is there a virus of error? And it's floating around here, and if you don't wash your hands real good, you'll rub your eyes, and it's got on your hands, and you'll infect yourself. Error travels the same way truth travels through people. So if you hear somebody or you're reading something and it goes against what you know the Bible says you ought to do or ought not do the way you're to do it, what do you do about that? Well, we shouldn't listen to it. And the only reason I might say that you might listen to it would be to refute it. That's the only reason I can. Can you think of any other reason to know what Satan has to say about matter? Except to refute it. Now, as we think then, we actually contemplate and meditate on the matter of listening to the serpent, knowing who it is that is actually using the serpent, in this case in the garden, to speak, then should we not also realize that Satan's going to use others to approach us? Consider with me then the nature of, the nature of the voice of the serpent. I think we will conclude that it's undoubtedly a pleasing voice. It's heard at times that are most expedient or advantageous to the devil. It's heard in places where it would not ordinarily be expected. Now think about where Satan is and what he's doing, where they are. It will usually begin with some sort of insinuating question. And it will likely attempt to remove any and all fear in your mind of disobeying God. It will promise reward or rewards, plural, and they may be very great rewards. And you know it may actually include some element of truth. It brings, though, in reality, grief and pain and anguish and sorrow and suffering and great worry or anxiety to those who give ear to it, that is, who listen to it. It often causes the innocent to suffer. It often causes one to want to try to attempt to hide from God. That's the nature of Satan's voice. But the when, the when of it is interesting too. The when of it. Well, you're listening to the voice of the serpent when you're tempted when you're solicited to disregard or to violate the Word of God. When you're tempted to violate your own conscience. When you're tempted to disregard or to criticize parental guidance and parental judgment. When you're tempted to disregard or to criticize parental authority. When you are tempted to argue the littleness of the thing, the littleness of it, often what seems to be so little in our sight is not so little at all. Not any big thing. Why are you so upset over all of this? When you're tempted to be more concerned about pleasing yourself than about pleasing God. When you're tempted to argue, I just don't see any harm in it. When you're tempted to argue why everybody's doing it. And when you're tempted to think, no one will ever find out. 
Or, and this seems to be one that all sorts of members of the church use along with these others, well, you're tempted to argue that this is not as bad as what brother so-and-so is doing. Or, you're a sinner, and so-and-so's a sinner. <coughs> so, why should we deal with either one of them? <laughs> when you're tempted to accept the doctrine that it really doesn't make any difference what you believe, just so you're sincere in the belief of it. When you're tempted to accept the doctrine... After all, we really don't have to be completely obedient to God's will. We can't do that anyway, can we? Salvation is really a matter of God's favor. Now, we'll many times argue the truth of the Bible on how grace through the gospel and the terms of the gospel reaches the person on the outside of Christ so he can become a Christian and have his alien sins forgiven and believing and obeying from the heart the steps and the plan of salvation. But later on in the church, dealing with our brothers and sisters, we'll make the same argument that those outside of Christ do to get out from under obeying the terms of the gospel to justify sin in the church. Now you figure that one out. Well, I can tell you how it happens. We're listening to the voice of the serpent. When you're tempted to question the goodness of God, why did God do this to me? Why did he allow this to happen? When you're tempted to question the severity of God. Now, that's a novel idea in our day and time that God would dare be. And he's a God of love. He would dare be a God of severity. The Bible teaches one as much as it does the other. When you're tempted to question the very motive of God. Never understood that. Hear me, a mere human being, limited in every fashion. And I don't know anything about God's ultimate design. And the details of it as far as eternity is concerned. How to get me from here on earth into glory. And I want to start questioning God. Now the proper response is something I'm interested in. And in order to look at it more, let's go to the Old Testament passages that were written before time for your learning and mine. Romans 15.4. And see if they won't help us understand how to deal with such things. If you look over in the 22nd chapter of the book of Numbers, Moses has recorded us there the matter of, of Balaam. You'll remember that the Israelites were encamped in the plains of Moab and that Balak, who's king of the Moabites, <coughs> desired this prophet Balaam to come to him and he wanted him to condemn, to curse the Israelites. And uh, the king, Balak, sent messengers to obtain the services of Balaam. And he offered the man great rewards. Instead of standing firm and of emphasizing what he knew to be true about these people, Balaam gave them lodging, that is the messengers from Balak, and uh, he said, I will bring you word again. Now, there's something we need to note about this. There are some things one just does not take time to think over. You know, we call that, and once we determine where the wind's blowing, then we thought it over and we know where we're going to come down. There are some people one just does not entertain. Now, what did I say back earlier about let's give Satan equal time? No. He doesn't deserve any time. Balak sent messengers again. Sent more of them this time. And they're said to be more honorable. And Balak actually upped the price. I'll do whatsoever thou sayest to me. Now eventually Balaam went to Balak. He wanted the Israelites condemned. But God changed Balaam's words into a blessing to the Israelites. In this matter, then Balaam lost the favor of the king, but he also lost the favor of God. When Balaam thought upon the invitation, then he thought about the rewards. You know what he was doing? He was hearing the hiss of the serpent that Eve heard back there in the garden. 
Numbers 31.8 tells us he was later, that is Balaam, slain in battle. Well, there's one way that people respond to Satan. But the Old Testament doesn't close with that example only. It's a very negative example. In other words, we don't do what Balaam did. And that's why it's written in the Bible. But let's look to another. And that is Joseph. And you'll notice some of these are coming out of what Brother Nero used. And that's the reason I thought about some of this. Genesis 39 records this about Joseph. Joseph had been placed after being sold into slavery in Potiphar's household. And well, that was a good thing, wasn't it? And the fellow says, no, that was a bad thing. <laughs> well, it was a good thing in one day, but Satan is certainly using it. This gave a certain wicked woman. Potiphar's wife, opportunities to attempt the seduction of Joseph. She pleads with the man, tries to worry him into committing fornication. Joseph said, and this begins to tell us how he treated the hiss of the serpent. In his own mind, he says to himself, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now that implies he already knew the truth of God regarding such matters, and he knows it's wickedness. And he knows that's not the thing to do. The record says, he hearkened not unto her. What did we say earlier? Now, Balaam would have cut everything off if he had just not hearkened to Balaam. This man is far ahead of Balaam in his love for the Lord, his dedication to him, and his faith in him. He knows the truth. He says, I can't violate the truth, and I'm not going to listen to you. Now, from the devil's viewpoint, circumstances were quite good. Think about the circumstances. He had an agent of sin who was anxious to do his bidding. Didn't care one thing in the world about what God said on any matter. The appeal would be about the strongest possible among men. But in this case, the devil was not dealing with the Balaam. The devil's dealing with Joseph, faithful servant of the living God. And he would not listen to the voice of the serpent. Now, how should we then deal with the voice of the serpent? Like Balaam? Too often we do. We take time to listen. We want to see how the wind's blowing. We want to try to come up with a political approach. Well, there's wrong here and there's wrong there. And if we do this, then we're going to be permitting that. And no, that's listening to the voice of the serpent. You already know what the Bible says, as Eve did. So we want to do exactly as Joseph did and not as did Balaam or Eve. We must, it's imperative, know that Satan is ever anxious to speak to us. And we must know how he speaks to us. And I'm telling you, from Genesis 3, you know how he speaks to us. He wants to get our attention. Think about it for a minute. You ever try to get your children's attention? Oh, no, let's not stop there. Wives, have you ever tried to get your husband's attention? We must know well the nature of Satan's hiss. We must learn to recognize what he has to say. One of the hardest things, if you want to know from my perspective, in being a preacher of the gospel over the years, is to watch people listen to the hiss of Satan, and they don't know a snake's even in their presence. And they're making up their minds to do things because they want to please God. Well, I mind you, he did what she did. And in her mind, there was nothing there that says, I am in rebellion to God. That wasn't the way you deceive. We must determine to react always, always in harmony with the will of heaven. We must resist him. Now, the Bible makes it clear that that's our duty. James tells us that in James chapter 4. Listen to this. Very simple, written to Jews who are Christians, but there's problems in that church among those Jewish Christians. In James 4 and verse number 7, watch it, and it covers everything we said. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, 
and he will flee from you. The first step in resisting is I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to listen to you. Now, do you think submitting yourself to the will of God is going to be the way that you resist Satan? And will he run? Yes, he will. He cannot stand you answering him with a thus saith the Lord in your mind, in your actions, in your words. He can't stand it. And the Lord showed us how that ought to be done. You have the same idea presented through the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 5 and verse 9. Same thing. Listen. Whom resist, how? Steadfast in the faith. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. We must imitate the Lord. And every case that Satan approached Jesus in the flesh, the Lord answered him with the rightly divided word of God. And it answered him. And when he found out you can't get through to this fellow, he was gone. Now why is that in your Bible when you read it? What does that tell you that you must do regarding resisting Satan? Don't listen to him. You already know what's right. But I see it over and over again, over the years of preaching. People will agree, they'll compliment the sermon, they'll tell you that's right, they'll make proper comments in class, they'll make proper deductions from it, but when it comes right down to the practical application, they fall right back where the world is and how the world operates. Well, Eve learned the hard way, the very terrible and tragic consequences of listening to the voice of the serpent. She learned that disobedience is just that. It's disobedience. It, can be, it cannot be colored any other way. It can't be made out to be anything else. Disobedience to God's will is just that. It's disobedience to God's will. You can bring in people into it. You can talk about this. You can talk about that. They can be your family. They can be your best friend. Somebody else will be wrong who's making the accusation. But if the accusation is true... It's just true and demands our response to it only on the basis of the authorized will of God make a difference about anything else. And when it comes down to this matter of disobedience, well, is a person obedient or disobedient? One or the other. <laughs> and if the person is disobedient, then the Bible's clear about how you deal with disobedient people. Don't dress it up. Make it a Christmas tree so you can't see through to what the thing really is. In fact, thinking of Christmas trees, think of how they look. And then you drag them out of the house after taking everything in the world off other than that made them so spectacular. Have you ever noticed how pitiful January the 1st is with the Christmas trees laying out there beside the road? And yet everybody was having all sorts of wonderful things as to that Christmas tree. But now it's just an old dried out tree. Well, when we try to make something uh, out of disobedience that it's not, <laughs> then uh, we are kind of dress the thing up like a Christmas tree, but it's still that same old cut down dead tree. Disobedience is nothing more than disobedience. Even if the person is so deceived, they think it's a good thing like Eve was or like Balaam was. Eve learned that not all things which are pleasing to the eyes are really good. She learned that God's goodness and mercy didn't preclude His justice. She learned the sin, one, of engaging in and partaking of that which God had not authorized. Two, of doing what God had explicitly, in just so many words, forbidden she and Adam to do. Turn your heart and all that you are your mind, so that we'll be tuned in and do it right now to listen and listen only to the voice of the Lord in the Word of the living God, rightly divided as we're taught to study at 2 Timothy 2.15. Know there's the standard and there is no other. 
And anything that comes into your mind that says you can be justified in God's sight and He's going to be happy with you that causes you to be disobedient and feel good in it is the voice of the serpent. And that's all it is. So He invites you now in the good gospel of Jesus Christ, if you're not a Christian, to become a Christian. Now you can sit there and say, well, I already am a Christian. Well, have, are you really? Are you honestly going to evaluate your life at this point in the light of the truth of God's Word and only the truth of God's Word? Do you know that the New Testament says that the Word of God creates the right kind of belief or faith in you concerning God, Christ, the Bible, and the gospel plan of salvation, and only the Word of God can do that? And that that Word of God says it's imperative, you can't get around it, you must believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. John 8, 24. Now, have you been taught that's it? There's where you stop. Nothing else is expected of me. But the Bible doesn't stop there. The New Testament of your Savior, the Christ, doesn't stop there. For the same Bible that says you absolutely must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and tells you that faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, says that you must repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Does the doctrine you've been taught concerning salvation say, no, the moment I believe in Christ and take Him as my Savior, I'm saved, nothing else. Well, what are you going to do about the rest of the Bible? The Word of God, the will of Christ, when He says the believer must repent of his sins. You know that the people who were believers, when you read the first recorded gospel sermon on the day the church started in Acts chapter 2, said to those believers in Christ, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Have you been taught your sins are forgiven before you repented and before you were baptized for the remission of sins? If you have, they haven't taught you the whole truth of Jesus Christ concerning how a person becomes a Christian or when a person becomes a Christian, when one's sins are forgiven. You can be sincere in what you believe. doesn't change the Word of God. There can be some folks that are mighty good friends of yours you've been exposed to most of your life. Maybe they've been in your family. And they said, all you have to do is believe that Christ is the Son of God. The rest of it make any difference. Well, the Bible does not teach that. The Bible says belief is absolutely necessary. Read Hebrews 11, 1 and 6, along with all the other passages regarding belief. And you know, I accept every one of them. But there's not a passage in the New Testament that says belief only saves anybody. It's not there. But the denomination of the world says it does. Now, which one's the voice of God which one's the voice of Satan? The voice of God says not only belief but repentance and it also talks about confessing one's faith in Christ, Romans 10 and verse 10. And then it tells you exactly when your sins are remitted. And that's when you're immersed in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the very remission of your sins. Now, it's not at belief. It's not at repentance. And it's not at confession. And yet they're all in the plan. The belief and the repentance and the confession qualifies you to complete your obedience to Christ to become a Christian. And when is that? When you're immersed in water by the authority of Christ. And every, listen, every case of conversion in the divine word of God in the book of Acts, every case, the person's not a child of God until they've been baptized for the remission of their sins. Now, what are you going to listen to? The full, complete teaching of the New Testament on just exactly how a person becomes a Christian and when they become a Christian? Or are you going to listen to all these other things that doesn't go along with the Word of God? Well, you're back there with Mother Eve if you do. So the Lord's telling us plainly and inviting us to become a Christian, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else, not some sort of hyphenated Christian. The Lord will add you to His church if you're baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. Galatians 3 and verse 27, Acts 2, 47. And He won't do that until you do it. That's just the will of God. Well, I don't like that. It's still the will of God. Anything else is disobedience. Then we live the Christian life in the church as the New Testament teaches about worship and Christian conduct. That's faithful living. And if you do that until you die, the Lord comes back. Heaven will be your home. 
And when you know what the Bible teaches on the organization, the worship, and the work of the church, and individual Christian living, and marriage, and divorce, and remarriage, and how the home is to function, and you live like that, and you oppose everything against it, that's faithful Christian living, heaven will be your home. Anything less, heaven won't be your home. Don't listen to the hiss of the serpent. Don't let the voice of Satan keep you from becoming a Christian. Don't let the voice of Satan justify you as a child of God in your disobedience to him when you know you're not living like the Bible says a Christian ought to live. Don't let your position, maybe as an elder or a deacon or a Bible school preacher, say, well, I can't afford to admit that I did wrong. Well, you can't afford not to admit you did wrong. <laughs> if heaven's to be your home, don't deceive yourself. Making there was what position you hold in the church or how, whatever it is you think about it. If you are determining that you don't have to change your ways on a certain point where God says you must, then you're listening to the voice of Satan. Don't let that stop you from living a faithful Christian life and fool yourself into thinking all these other great and good things I've done. Surely the Lord won't be so touchy on that one. I close by saying what I said earlier. Disobedience is disobedience, and that's all you make out of it. And no person is going to go to heaven when they know they've been disobedient, and they will not repent of that disobedience and prove they repented by the new life they're living that's contrary to the old. So I do thank you good men who deliver those lessons. It helps me personally. And you know when it comes down to it, I'm just not too proud or both to say David Brown wants to go to heaven, and I know the way. And if you can help me go to heaven and the way the Bible talks about that help, that's wonderful. But don't come hissing in my ear. Are you subject to the Lord's invitation? If so, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.